Steve Gachdina Agus Vorgiat Falt is Jach Godin live Q and A in Ucht. Um, so you're very welcome to this month's live Q and A. It's Misha Ashling. Agus Misha Shuwan. Tasuda gum gul gachdina gama. Um, we have another lockdown here in Ireland, so it's nice to spend the the evenings chatting to to you this evening. And um, so we have a few questions coming in um, that came in throughout the week, and we have we'll probably have some more in the comments. So we'll get right into it. <laughs> so the first question here comes from Rudbard, um in Australia. And his question is for everyone, not just for the Bite Size team. He says, I would like to know if there are any websites or online games or anything at all that has been made to help people with dyslexia or other learning problems learn Irish. If the Bite Size team don't know, uh, if someone watching this session does know, could they please put a message? So that's a, a great question there, Ribard. Now, I'm afraid I don't know of any resources that were created specifically for those with dyslexia or um, with any other learning problems. Uh, but, but someone else may, but I don't, unfortunately. But according to the uh, Phonetics and Speech Laboratory, in Trinity College Dublin, Irish is a phonetic language, especially compared to English or French for that matter. And this means that it doesn't have as many spelling exceptions compared to English. So it makes it easier for Irish learners with dyslexia compared to learners of many other languages. It's recommended for those with dyslexia uh, who are learning languages to listen to the language they're learning from as soon as they start to learn that language, even if you don't understand what's being said. This will get your ear acquainted with the language, its unique sounds. It also, it's also important that you pronounce a new word each time you learn it. This means having pronunciation databases on hand, such as the ones on Chonglin and folklore. And I'll just bring up um links to those because they're those are great websites for anyone um so this is that uh, this is it here and uh, you'd see it at the bottom of the screen so those are great places and there's you you can um find the pronunciation of most words there so when you come across a word get it, look it up and you'll find the basic form of each word on those websites and you'll hear them pronounced in three different dialects uh, now, having someone who knows the language to ask is the ideal scenario, of course, because they can pronounce words uh, as because words like in, in all languages, they're pronounced differently in every sentence in a way. It, it, they can be pronounced a bit differently depending on context. Um, and uh, also in Irish, of course, words mutate a bit. So the endings might be a bit different. The, beginning might be a bit different so it's 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 really if I, I guess if you have a learning problem of any type you should really get yourself a teacher uh, or at least get to know someone who speaks Irish to some level um to some level of proficiency because otherwise it will it will be quite difficult for you um I would recommend as well practicing regularly um everyday vocabulary and you'll find this everyday vocabulary in the bite-sized courses or in a textbook that includes a CD. Again, the sound recordings are very important and the bite-sized courses include these sound recordings. Uh, so as they say, practice makes perfect. So make sure to go over the simpler lessons, both listening and reading aloud on a regular basis. Uh, reading scripts, as we do in bite Size Bio, and that's our weekly live sessions on Zoom and also reading stories that have voice recordings are really helpful um, and reading aloud and doing your best to pronounce the words as they're pronounced in the recording and to read along that, that'll help that that'll not only help someone with dyslexia but just any learner that's very helpful for anyone and um, as I mentioned earlier, Irish is a surprisingly phonetic language, so you can learn how to pronounce words fairly accurately with our Crack Irish pronunciation course, which is included in our Bite Size course. So um, don't worry, I would say, don't worry if you keep making spelling or pronunciation mistakes. 
uh, this will come with practice and everyone learns at a different pace. Whether you have a learning problem or not, of course, if you have a learning problem, it's, it's, it is admittedly going to be more difficult. It depends on the person, though, and that's how things are. So I hope mm-hmm. that helps you out there with that. And yeah. hopefully someone does know of some resources out there. And if there aren't, hopefully someone will, will, will put some together soon. Yeah. Do you have anything to say on that can... there, Ashling? Yeah, what we can do is that that's great advice. And I think what you said about kind of practicing the words and pronunciation, even in Irish, like the kind of combination of letters, they repeat themselves a lot. So, for example, um, A-O-I, like in the name Aoife, when those three come together, they're usually an E sound. So if you can practice that and kind of spot those in words and say, OK, there's that combination again. So I remember how to pronounce that and just kind of familiarize your brain with it, I suppose, in a way. But that advice was excellent, Siobhan. I think that's kind of that's the main thing practice and what we can do is as well we can put it up on Pubble and see if anyone knows of any resources or any kind of story websites where they read the stories out loud that you might be able to um follow along with as well Robert so we'll we'll definitely keep looking into this because um it's brilliant that you're so kind of committed to learning and you want to just persevere with it so we'll definitely try and help you out so um yeah good night Rilat. um Okay, so the next question then we have is from Melinda, who is a one of our GROW members. Um, and I had a chat with her there recently for one of our podcasts. She's very interesting. Um, and she said, what is the difference in the usage of the adverbs aun, agus and shin? Both mean there, but aun also means inexistent. They seem, or sorry, in existence. So they seem to be used interchangeably. So she wants to know the difference between those. So on shin, is there but more in a definite sense so if you took my pen and i said call with muffyown and you said toshe on shin and you point to the table it means it's there on the table you're pointing to exactly where there is it's a specific place a specific location but aun as you said can also mean in existence but it's also the prepositional pronoun in it um so a august a becomes aun um and it can also mean there, but in a more general sense. So, you know, for example, if someone says, oh, I went to college in UCC and you said, oh, I went there as well. It's not a specific room in UCC. You're talking about the college. You're talking about four years you spent in a place. So you'd say, me aun. I went there. So it's more of a vague being there as opposed to a very specific location. Um, and then the kind of in existence, if you wanted to say, does that word exist in Irish? And when I'll fuck I'll shin aun so gaelge, tashe aun so gaelge, nu so gaeling. Um, so the main difference, I suppose, is that in shin is a very specific place, and aun is more vague or in existence. So I hope that kind of clarifies things a bit for you. Um, do you have anything else to add to that, Siobhan? Um, I don't think so. Now I think that you've really covered it all there. You've really covered it all. Um, but that's it. The unchain, I guess, um, I guess, I guess, on or on. That's it. Um, the the unchain is more there as an over there, and on or on is more in existence. That's it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. On Waterford. So, uh, oh yes. So the next question then is from Patrick Dunn in Nevada, USA. And his question is, it's unclear on the difference. I'm unclear, sorry. I'm unclear on the difference between nor and nach. Also, how to figure the orthography of the verb when a question is in the negative. So, simply put, nor uh, is the past tense of nach. So that's a very simplified way of thinking of it, but we'll break it down a bit more now. When asking a negative question in the past tense, you use nor followed by the verb with a shavu or lenition, as it's also called, on the first letter, if applicable. So that's this. If that's it's it's applicable if the word begins with a consonant. So an example would be nor lantue, didn't you clean us? So it's a negative question, didn't you? Nor lantue, didn't you clean us? Uh, nach, however, is used with various tenses, not uh, not just the one tense. So it can be used with the present tense, the future tense, and the conditional. 
for, the, for simplicity's sake, however, we'll just go with a question in the present tense. And that question is, Nach nlanan tuwe grilta. Don't you clean it regularly? Nach nlanan tuwe grilta. So, um, as you can see here, Nach causes the verb to begin with the oro, or eclipses. And um, so it's a bit different there, and that would be the same. Uh, it would also cause this, the oro or eclipses, as it's called in English, to happen in the in, in also the future and conditional tenses. So that is the addition of the N to the G. So nor and nach can also be used when making a statement. So it's not it's not just used when you're when asking a question. And let's use two examples for that. Unfair nor lan of roga. The man who didn't clean his shoes. Unfair not lan of roga. And if you're going to use nach, unfair nach lan of roga. The man who doesn't clean his shoes. So in this case, we're using the, the present tense. So those are the, diff the, the different ways that nor and nach are used commonly. So I hope that answers your question there, Patrick. Um, have you any more to add to that there, Ashling? No, I think that's a very good summary of it. Um, the... I forgot about when I was reading that question, I forgot about oh um the statement kind of a way and, and one you'd hear a lot is nach das, isn't that lovely, or nach alling, isn't that lovely? So um yeah, I think that's a, a perfect explanation of it. Um yeah. so hopefully that clears things up for you, Patrick. Um so the next question is from another member, um Aegon, and he's all the way in Australia and he always gets up early for the bite size events, so he might be up again at five o'clock in the morning in uh, Australia for this. Um, so he says, Thea Grish, Ashling, Aga Siobhan, Takesh to come Peg. Uh, so Peg is the, it's a autobiography um, that used to be on the Irish education syllabus for the Irish language for the Leaving Cert. So for example, my parents' generation, our parents' generation would have done it in school and they have kind of opinions on, on the book. So this is what Aegon is asking about. So he went through the Northern Ireland education system, so he never covered Peg, but has heard a lot of these lazy narratives. Um, and apparently she was trending on Twitter recently and there was a whole Mother Fuck Lore uh, podcast episode devoted to her. Um, so he is wondering whether we have read the books and what our thoughts are on her book. Um, he said he went to the Blaskets last year and fell in love with the place um, and understands probably that Peg's time on the Blaskets was quite tough. So um for those of you who don't know about Peg, that's kind of a brief summary of her involvement in the Irish syllabus. But she lived on the Blasket Islands, which are islands off West Kerry in the uh, Kerry Gaeltacht Kirkaguine. Um, no one lives on them anymore. I think they were abandoned in 1956. Um, but there was a huge um, mass migration from the Blaskets to Springfield in Massachusetts. So there's a lot of people in that area who probably would have descendants from the Blaskets. Um, so and there was loads of literature done the baskets but anyway we'll get into the question so i studied peg in university um as part of we did literature of the baskets um and i really really enjoyed the book I, i'd heard those narratives as well my parents always saying that you know peg was miserable to read and it turned them off irish and it was depressing and all of this but i really enjoyed the book and maybe that's because i'm a bit of a nerd and I, I love irish but i think her book is really special um so it was written in the 1900s. Uh, I think it was 1920s or 30s that it was written. Um, and maybe it was earlier than that. But It was the 1930s. It, it was published, I think, in the 1930s. It might have been yeah. um, written earlier. I'm not sure, but it was the 30s anyway. Yeah, because I, I I know there was a lot of literature published around that time. A lot of scholars went to the Blaskets from mainland Europe and Britain and were just fascinated by this place because it was essentially completely self-sufficient, you know, like for for the time they didn't depend on anyone else they fished all their own food they had sheep and um, everything they needed was on that island really um but then for such a small population there was such a rich culture of stories and music and everything like that so people came to this island to just kind of learn more about these people who had no reading or writing and had such a wealth of literature and culture within them so a lot of them a lot of these scholars went and took down these people's stories or taught them how to read and write. Um, so there's lots of other books from the Blaskets, but Peg is probably the most famous one. And also something to note is that, you know, she was a peasant woman, um, a Gwailgore peasant woman. And it's so rare that at that time, 
anywhere in the world that a woman, a poor woman's autobiography in her native language would have been published. So that alone is quite monumental and something to kind of appreciate, you know. And and I heard as well somewhere, I think a lecturer might have said to us in college that apparently at the time it was kind of the beginning of the free state and the government wanted to promote this idea of a, a kind of an example, exemplary Irish person. And Peg was that, you know, she was religious, she was uh, she was very strong in the face of the difficulties of life and things like that. So people say that it might have been some kind of propaganda in that way, um, that she was kind of an exemplary girl, um, quote unquote. So um, basically all of that is to say that I, I really enjoyed the book um, and I really enjoyed the books from the Blaskets because it's kind of a magical life they they almost portray. You know, they're, they're completely separated from the rest of society and they don't have the same kind of standards about you know that there's no shame there at all they're very free people obviously the life is very difficult but they're very free um and the last thing i'll say about peg is that there's also controversy around the translation of peg um because it was her son and someone else that helped her you know she told her stories out loud and then someone wrote them for her and there is question whether or not her son actually changed some of the stories based on what he thought people might want to hear or not so um Another book I would recommend from the Blaskets is Fihibli and the Gfoss or 20 Years a Growing is a wonderful book as well. So that might be um Siobhan Cadde Capin Oh, it's on Laura Fihibli and the Gfoss and Spur Yule. Uh, mm. I think people would actually find that better as a as a book um, for school because it is a great, a, a very enjoyable book. It's very enjoyable. And it is, it, it is about the first 20 years of his life. So I think it would be more suitable um, mm -hmm. as a school book but that being said um, Pig is, isn't um, isn't it has been very much maligned and unfortunately and it is a very good book as you were saying there Rashling it it is it is extra special to have a book from an ordinary housewife mm -hmm. um, and it's it, it, it and to see a positive view of that um, it's just a, an ordinary housewife from a, an isolated island and to have her voice heard um to this day regularly uh, and offer e easily it, it can be easily found so i think that's very good um and it is unfortunate how people really hated her and, and still do and it makes no sense she did nothing on no one mm -hmm. um and um it's it's unfortunate that people can see it in a more positive light um but uh, I read uh, Pig when I, uh, when I was in my teens and I found it really interesting. And I, I thought it was quite a rich and colourful portrayal of the life on the island. Now, admittedly, it could be dark at times, but I guess that depends on the person. Some people kind of like that kind of da maybe darker humour or have an appreciation for that. But she, like Pig, she didn't try and like I would say sugarcoat life or it wasn't like lots of memoirs you find this it's all through rose tinted glasses or it's just misery one or the other whereas I found pig was more a mixture of both like I remember uh, her um how she was describing playing with, as a child with her friend and stuff like that and she had to pair with her friend because her friend immigrated and that was hard that was difficult that was the sad part but before that they were happy as children and when she when she married like when when her match was made like she was so delighted with herself she was just she was so proud of of, of her man and everything she was thinking like no girl has his man a man as handsome as this fella and everything she was so proud of herself and she seemed to be very happily married and she did uh, as well um uh, relate the struggles of life and if anyone's been to the island as, as I've been it's a beautiful beautiful place but when you look around and you see the little houses that they had little cottages and um many of these people like you have to really appreciate the lifestyle even you appreciate the, the the amount of luxury we have today um when you see the little houses they they they, they rear their families in and um, so you really have to ha have to um look up to people like pig like pig as you're saying there some people might think of it as free state propaganda but she she really is a uh, someone to look up to and if we were only half 
the women that, that, that half the woman pig was when you think of it like she 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 lived a tough life um and she 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 lived to to tell her tale literally um so it's um it's it's quite a feat uh so so i'd say it's um it's it's good to see people um having a more positive view of pig these days it's it's very mm. good yeah yeah, so um, I guess we'll move on then um, to uh, Billy's question. And Billy is in Wexford. And his question is about sentence structure in conversation and in translation. He says, I find when I look at an article in Irish, although I recognise most of the words and their meanings, using a dictionary for the rest, the translation is sometimes of... is." sometimes of different concepts to mine and also where to place certain words in a long sentence of text for example the vso structure verb subject object uh, rules are easy to understand in very basic irish but not so easy to understand in newspaper articles in irish where a, a sentence can go on and on how can i approve so it's a very good question there billy so how mm -hmm. would you say to that there ashling I think it's a very good question and I can absolutely see where you're coming from because even I remember myself in school, if we were reading something a bit more complicated and my Irish wasn't great, I would get lost in these long sentences as well and I, I kind of wouldn't understand how they would form the question, the sentences. If they're very long, the structures can be kind of confusing. So I absolutely understand where you're coming from. I think the if if you see a sentence like that, maybe try and break it up. Um, and break it up to the point where you understand the structure and try and identify verb, subject, object, things like that. They might not be in that order, but try and break them up and understand it that way before you try and get the whole thing. Um, I definitely think that Irish is one of those languages where you kind of have to, there's a lot of groundwork you have to do before you get to a stage where everything falls into place. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but just sometimes it might be a slow, a, a jump to reading newspaper articles might involve, okay, going through sentences painstakingly and seeing, okay, where do I get this structure? Where does it get confusing to me? Why is that? But I will say the VSO structure is is the most common structure that you'll learn about. Um, but a lot of the time, the the sentence might begin with something they want to emphasize. Um, so especially in newspaper articles, if there's something they really want to emphasize, um, it might not, the, the sentence might not begin with the verb. So for example, the one that came to me was Aaron Lewin a horlache. So it happened on Monday, but in Irish, they might start with the on Monday. So Aaron Lewin a horlache. Um, so if it's an idea, a word, a person, or a concept that wants to be emphasized in the, in the sentence, they might start it with that. Um, so... I think that's something to, to keep in mind. And I, I kind of was thinking as well when I was reading your question, I was reading an article um, about mindfulness the other day on tourish.ie, which is the kind of main news and, and opinion website for uh, Gregory. And there's great stuff on there as well for learners. But um, as I was reading it, I was thinking, God, this would be a nightmare for someone learning because the, the sentence structure was very strange. And, and he kind of spoke in almost the way you would speak, or sorry, he wrote almost in the way you would speak um very dialectical and, and some of the sentences didn't even have verbs and they kind of would run into each other a bit so if you're reading something that's in a newspaper you know don't be too hard on yourself because there could be a lot of factors going in there that might mess with the sentence structure but I do believe that Siobhan has a great image to share with you about sentence structure so that might help you a bit but that's my spiel <laughs> oh very good that was a very good um explanation of it there very good Ashling. and uh, so I'll bring up this um this mystery image now uh, so <laughs> i hope you can all see this oh yes there it is so these are the eight possible parts of a sentence in irish and you can see there's the what's called here the proverbial particle so that's just like it, we can hear see it color coded at the bottom the on so if it's a question it's like the on the question part verb so you've got the verb um the subject she and the direct object capra in this case the indirect object done air uh, location descriptor and show uh, manner descriptor gamal and time descriptor imagine so th these are all parts now they don't all have to be there 
um, of course, we basically we just need uh, verb, subject, object, or the copula in case of in, instead of the verb. So is, um, but um, so so this is a, a longer sentence, and just to make it a bit so you can see it all there. Uh, so um, as you can see in English. It's you. You can you can apply it to English as well as it's uh, by the color coding. So you can compare what um, what each word means and what what um, what the functions they have. Uh, so it's um, it's good to this now is a part of one of our course. Uh, one of our courses. It's in one of the lessons. It's the lesson on sentence structure in one of the bite size courses. Uh, so it goes through that there in more detail within the lesson. But that's the thing. Um, the most important thing I would say is to the first thing I recommend is to spot the verb or the copula. Sometimes they can be left out when it's very dialectal, as you're saying there, Ashling. But usually you will have a verb. Uh, so try try and make out things as much as possible. Uh, some things are idioms. And if, when you translate them, literally, especially, they make absolutely no sense they're just gobbledygook so i would say in that case google it try and see if someone else if someone else has written this maybe it is a common idiom um so i would say that or just parts of the sentence try and break it down exactly like try as you were saying there ashling break it down retrieve as much as possible from it that you do understand simplify it a lot um like in this in this sentence, Anyer Nashi Kepra, did she make a sandwich? You mightn't get the rest of it, um, but you're getting the gist of it. All right, she's making a sandwich, and then you can kind of work on from there. Um so so that's the thing, that's that's what I would recommend. So I hope um you find that helpful there. Um Billy. Yeah. Um yeah, hopefully that yeah, that's a the main thing I suppose break it down try and get what you can out of it that you understand and then go from there um so the next question then we have is from Patricia Duggan and she is in Buffalo um so she says how could I find an Irish pen pal to communicate with through the Irish language to help me with reading writing and perhaps speaking via zoom or such to learn more about the Irish language culture in the Gwaeltacht so that's a lovely idea um I remember at the start of the pandemic there was something um there was a kind of pen pal scheme going on. People were exchanging details and I couldn't find the exact information, whether that's still happening or not. But I do believe that it was happening on a few Facebook groups. So everything is online at the moment. And because of the pandemic as well, there, people are connecting with people from all over the world, especially through the Irish language. And we do have Pubble on Bite Size, um, which is our community for Irish language learners. And it does allow people to connect with people on the same time zones or in the same country as them. Um, so if you were on Pubble, you could say, oh, is there anyone else from Buffalo? And you might be able to, um, you know, chat to each other and practice. Um, or there could be someone from Ireland that you'd like to connect with and you can write to them. So obviously, I would absolutely recommend Pubble. Um, if you're on Facebook, there are lots of groups on Facebook. Um, one of them is Gaelge Awan, which means only Irish. And there's thousands and thousands and thousands of members on that. Um, and I'm sure if you posted in there and said, I'm looking for a pen pal, you probably could find someone. Um, I know there's another group as well called Tome Ag Faulam Gaelge. And that's probably more learners as well. Um, so you could definitely post in there. And um, that's the first Facebook group there, Gaelge Awan, yeah. um, only Irish. So you could post in there. And then the next one, Tome Ag Faulam Gaelge. Um, so you might be able to find someone there to my knowledge I don't know if there's any concrete system for connecting people in that way so it might be kind of a case of going on Facebook going on social media or going on Pubble and connecting with people that way um, do you have any other tips um, yes um, I'd say any sort of forums you can come across anything like this and uh, that's and mm. um, there's uh, forums within like the site italki um duolingo in the comments and duolingo practically anywhere you can find other people who are interested in learning irish and um of course a lot a lot of time people want someone who's pretty proficient um so search around search in irish 
go you can go on Twitter, just ask the question Twitter or hashtag Gaelga, um, and someone should see it. So there's just just reach out on social media. Um, that's what I'd recommend. Uh, when it comes to Gaelga one, that tends to be only in Irish, and I think that's the rule. It has to be in Irish. So if you are to write there, just write in Irish. Um, but Tommy, following the Gaelic is more open to um to non-proficient learners. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and it was uh, anything else there then. Um, so let's see. Uh, so, um, yeah, so Patricia, I hope you, you find a, a pen pal soon. And just to reach out there to everyone in the in the live chat, it's nice to see everyone, so many people tuning in and oh. interacting and everything. And hopefully we'll get to some of your questions uh, near the end. Uh, so let's move on then to um, James Mulligan, Orlando, Florida, and he asks, I believe one of the more difficult aspects in the Irish language is the prepositional phrase, and perhaps the most confusing is the use of in. Would you please explain the use of e, in, sa, san, and sna? So I think you've got the answer ready there, Ashling. <laughs> I do indeed, and I think... Um... James, this is one of those things that once it's explained to you, you'll never confuse them again. It's just that you might see them all in different places and say, I thought that was in, I thought this was in, I thought so. Once you once you hear this, hopefully it will help. Um, so I or in simply means in. OK, so I in in English in. Um, but it all depends on whether it has the definite article after it, meaning the or on in Irish or whether the word starts with a vowel or a consonant, all right? So if you're just saying in a box or in something, so you don't have the after it, um, so the example I have is in a box, it would be a muska, okay? So there's no the after in, so it's going to be a, all right? Um, similarly, if you're saying in America, you're not saying in the America, so it's just a America. Okay. Um, so if you're saying in a in English or in something without the definite article, it's going to be a. All right. So then the second one is um, the same context. So you don't have the definite article, um, but the word, the noun after in will start with a vowel. So for example, in water would be in ishke. You're not saying in the water, it's just in water. Um, so those two are for instances where there's no definite article, i or in, okay? Then the next one, sa, S-A, is basically i plus on, the definite article. So if we're saying in the house, sa, tach. So sa incorporates i plus on and becomes one word to be sa. And then similarly with in, sun is basically s, but for words that start with a vowel. So in the water would be sun ishke. So sun is incorporating i plus an for words that start with a vowel. And then the final one, sna is for plural nouns. Um, so in the schools, sna skolene. Um, so sna is incorporating i plus n. So hopefully that makes some sense. <laughs> and I'd just like to add there that when you're saying um, in schools, when it's indefinite, so sna is definite in the, but when you're just saying in um, in with no article, it's e, again, back to e. Um, so e skolana. Mm-hmm. So um, it doesn't matter if it's, um, if it's singular or plural, if it doesn't have the definite article, it's just e. Exactly. So hopefully that makes some sense. Um, it can be hard to, it'd be nice to have a little whiteboard here, a blackboard to write these things out. Um, so hopefully that makes some sense to you. Um, so, okay, I think we're good to move on to our final question here. Um, so this is from Dana or Dana, I hope I'm saying that right, in Chicago. So they say, recently in my local Gaelic class, I was reminded that some Irish Americans insist that the Irish language can be referred to as Gaelic. However, I learned that calling the Irish language Gaelic can be considered ignorant or even offensive to Irish speakers living in Ireland. 
in your opinion, when is it appropriate to utilize the term Gaelic? So it's actually very interesting. We had this conversation in one of our meetings and um, Siobhan, the Bite Size team, were talking about which is right or which is wrong. Or, you know, we were talking about this whole Gaelic versus Irish debate. And I don't think it's ever offensive or ignorant to call it Gaelic. I wouldn't be worried about that at all. Um, it's kind of just something that I think in the past in Ireland, older people, you were saying in our meeting that time, Siobhan, older people might call it Gaelic. And definitely in the early 1900s, like the Gaelic League, Conor na Gaelga, you know, Gaelic was very commonly used to say Irish. But with the passing of time, younger people just don't really call it Gaelic in Ireland. They'd mainly call it Irish. But, you know, it's not wrong to call it Gaelic. It's just kind of sometimes when you hear someone call it Gaelic, you think, OK, they might be not from Ireland. Um, and sometimes people might confuse Gaelic with Scots Gaelic, uh, which is this Scottish kind of equivalent or very similar language to Irish. Um, so I definitely wouldn't worry about it being offensive or anything like that. Um, it's just kind of a phenomenon that kind of has been used by people outside of Ireland learning Irish. Um, and it's just, it's kind of interesting, but neither are, you know, incorrect or none is more correct than the other. So would you kind of agree with that, Siobhan? I would, I would, because when you think of it, like, the, the the term for Irish, it's I a Gaelge in English is either the Irish language or Irish Gaelic. So mm -hmm. that's the thing because it is the Irish version of Gaelic, and that's why you've Scots Gaelic or Scottish Gaelic. Um, and um, even in 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 Scottish Gaelic, you call it Gaelic. Uh, so it's they're all very similar languages. So there's nothing wrong with saying Gaelic. No, no, there's nothing. And uh, some people get a bit confused because Gaelic is used for more than just the language, you see. So that's why people can get confused. What's so an adjective um, as well? So, for example, most people in Irish in Ireland, I think, would think of Gaelic as meaning Gaelic games, such as Gaelic football. Um, or Gaelic, um, you don't, I suppose that's the most common usage of Gaelic these days. Um, Gaelic uh, football but uh, that's the thing uh, strictly speaking though Gaelic is anything that is um, related to the Gael. so it's anything that's got to do with the Gaels as you'll see it, it, again it's a change that you see over time if you read things from about 100 years ago you don't have to go that far back but specifically particularly about 100 years ago you see often Irish people refer to as the Gales and you won't see that as much these days we hear of the Gales as probably um, a football um, uh, a football team or the like <laughs> the local GA team or something but um, yeah so it's again a change in, um, in, in, in terminology over the years but yeah mostly people refer to Gaelic as Irish mm -hmm. um, in, in Ireland today mostly and uh, mm -hmm. that's it. So no, no, no one should snap the head off you, though, if you say it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. will we have a look through some of the comments here and we can try and get some of the questions. Um, that was all, I think, that was submitted to the, the blog. Um, it, yeah. Okay. yeah, so I think um, there was uh, one there on pronunciation um where was this just now it was um oh and there's a good just before we go there that was a good suggestion Kirkel Cora if you're looking for a pen pal or anything track down the Kirkel Cora you can find these they're, like they're all online these days and you can find an awful lot of them around the world linked on pig.ie getting back to pig again <laughs> um pig.ie so I'll just uh write that up there pig.ie um so if you go in there and you search Kirkel Cora, you will see that, that website, you, you will find it or any of the, the events, it should be in the event section as, as well of that website. Um, so that was a great suggestion. Uh, so let's see now. Oh, yes. Uh, this is the one I was thinking of. Does Bite Eyes have any help with pronunciations? Mm -hmm. So um, we have the crack Irish pronunciation course within the Bite Size Coursey and in every lesson we have voice recordings and um, like a transcription as well 
and to help you pronounce the words. So mm-hmm. I'd say that we do have a lot of help when it comes to pronunciations. Of course, we have Pubble as well and Bite uh, Size Bio. So we go through scripts every week to practice reading aloud. So um, we, we, we give a lot of help when it comes to pronunciations. I'd say that's probably one of our main you know the main thing we kind of focus on there's as you said there's little sound bites beside every sentence on our course e and twice a week as well myself and Siobhan post a walk through lesson so we'll read through a lesson um very slowly so you can repeat it after us and bite size bio as well so you read out loud together and, and go through pronunciation so it's kind of the meat of of bite size is trying to get that pronunciation okay for you so you can um build on your conversational skills and everything like that so definitely um so I see another question here. Um, in Connacht, does Irish does so put an eru with the at the on the next word? And can you explain um, the dental rule? So yes, in in um, in Connacht Irish, they would say so nueltacht or um, so gar for so gar, and it's kind of just a dialectical um, preference they have. And um, but in the Kaidan, which is like the standardized way. S would have a, a H in the next word. So if you put S plus Uru, it's not incorrect at all. Um, it's just a kind of a dialectical preference. So that's perfectly fine. And then the dental rule is basically um, any words beginning with D, N, T or L often won't take those grammatical rules like S plus a H. So S, Tach instead of S, Hach, for example. Um, or S, Duras. As, a part, as opposed to or something like that. Um, so it's a very easy rule and it's kind of something you can bring to mind easily. Dental, okay, that's not going to take a shavu or an uru or whatever it might be. Um, so hopefully that kind of explains that for you. Yeah, and it's Brian Gael guests here. How do you pronounce um, R-A-I-B-H in Connacht? So I would say ro or raw. Um, there's a, a few different ways uh, to pronounce it. Uh, Roha Rao, I would say, for yeah. Connacht Irish. Yeah, that's, and, um, that's right, I'd say. And how would you say it in Munster then? Rev. Very much a, a hard V sound at the end, Rev. Um, a lot of Munster words, they'll pronounce every letter. So, you, you know, the Rev, the BH at the end, that would be very strongly pronounced. So, um, And then... In Ulster, be row, wouldn't it? Me row. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's so, um, so let's see um, if there's any more questions there. Um, oh, there's a good one here. Um, I have a hard time with the fine points of lenition. Is there a good way to learn what to do with each noun, depending on my, yours, hers, etc.? Okay, that's a very good question. Do you want to dig into that? Yeah, <laughs> um, sure. Why not? So I would say it. You it, to simplify it, you can break it down into three parts. So um, I'll try and get this up on the screen as well because it might help. Um, but mine yours and his they all cause lenition so um mo hot do hot so mo emo do do your mo is mine do is your a hot his cat so there mine yours and his all call shavo a cat is the um is the odd one out that's her cat so that one doesn't cause the nation, doesn't cause um, eclipses, doesn't cause shavu or aroro, a cut. Now, when it's plural, when it's theirs, his, um, sorry, theirs, ours, or yours in the plural sense, it's a got. So a got is their cat, war got, year cat, and our got, our cat. So all the plural ones cause auto or eclipse so that's a, a handy thing to remember so really if it's singular it causes shavu except um there's there's um kind of let's say special treatment given to the lady so she doesn't get any change <laughs> and then for the plural it's the auto the eclipses so that's a way of simplifying it i think i hope that helps 
I think that's and a very of course, good, very good, very good yeah. quick lesson there on, on the <laughs> possessive pronouns, Mao. <laughs> come on, come on. Um, and I suppose there are letters that don't take the the shape of, um, but like in and um, what else, l. So, but I think you you they they are, they if you have any book or anything on Irish, you usually find that they are listed out very easily, and it kind of it's it it's natural you you won't find yourself trying to to add a um a shave or lenition to an l i think too easily um and it that if you do it's something that'll go away quite quite quickly when you get used to of, of irish at all um so let's see um all right so there's a, a question here on harry potter in irish mm -hmm. um so i know there will there's at least one book you might know more about that now, Ashling. If there's uh, there's at least one book translated to Irish. Yeah, as far as I know, the first one is definitely translated, The Philosopher's Stone. I'm not sure if the whole series is, um, but there are a few very good bookshops um, online. So literiacht.ie or .com actually, literiacht.com. Um, it's a all an Irish language um, bookshop based in County Cork, I think. And they deliver all over the world and they have a great range of books. Um, and even if you, um, oh, she says, yes, I got the translation, but there's no translation with it. So you'd probably have to compare the English to the Irish one then, unfortunately, if there's no translation with it. Um, that's probably the best way to do it. Um, and I don't know if the whole series is available, but you can check literiach.com or look at any of the publishing, um, Irish publishing companies. So on Goom and... Um, Chloe Ear Connacht. Um, if you look up just Irish language publishing into Google, I'm sure you'd get a lot of these. Um, so hopefully that will help her. Yeah, just compare the, the English and the Irish, I suppose, might be the only way. Um, so it is very tough help. though when you're when you're starting off and you don't have Irish um mm. already to read such um a complex book. Um, because I've heard a lot of people say people who are proficient in Irish saying that they do have difficulties reading uh, Harry mm. Potter. Uh, I would recommend that, that if you want to, to learn Irish, not to start off with Harry Potter, start off with simpler stories. There's lots of children's stories online. Um, uh, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but I'll add the link in the notes uh, in the blog post that's linked in the description of this video i linked uh, um i link what's i think it's 130 children's stories being read aloud you can see the text and you can hear it so that's a great resource for anyone um so i linked that in um in in uh, on the blog post that's linked below uh, so i would recommend starting off with this and um, because mm -hmm. it's just too hard i would say just too hard um unless i you know it's 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 very hard to do that so even even if you had a teacher or someone who's proficient in, in irish reading it out loud to you that's really tough that's really tough mm -hmm. going you're um when you're just starting off it's it it would be very tough so i'd recommend um working up to that um, definitely yeah mm -hmm. As you said, actually, that's a good point. Some a lot of native speakers even say reading new literature in Irish is very difficult for them. And um, so if, as a learner, you know, that's a massive challenge to put it on yourself. So maybe start with simpler stories, children's stories, and then build up to that. Um, so let's see, are there any other ones now? I see here one from Jim Keenan, who is a member of Pubble as well. Um, and he says, does Irish have an expression like brothers in English um, or will it always show up as of a brother? Um, so the kind of possessive my brother's car, my brother's house or whatever. Um, so with possession like this, um, you'd use a very specific rule in Irish called the Tishil Ginnidach, which is the genitive case. Um, and it's the stuff of nightmares for some people. Some people really hate it. But it's it's not too bad. I mean, once you kind of are familiar with it, it's it's not too bad at all. Um, it would probably be it's a bit probably too complicated to try and explain here. But if you want to say, for example, my brother's house, you have tach house mo, 
And then if you want to find the genitive form, because the genitive basically it just changes the noun, it changes the structure of the noun a little bit. If you go on to tongalin.ie and there's a grammatical or a grammar database and if you type in a word, it will give you the genitive form under the nominative form. Um, so that might all sound like a bit like a bit uh, confusing and, and a bit um, too much at the moment. But basically, there is a certain rule for possession like that. When you have two nouns together that express possession, you would use the genitive case. Um, so Tonglin gives you that form of the noun if you're looking for it. Um, and oh, here we go. Excellent. Yeah. That's yeah, brilliant. So that's that's just, it's very good for that. If you go into the grammar tab and you'll see this is what we're looking for here. Singular nominative drahar on the well, sorry, that's the genitive is what we're looking for. Um so on drahar, that's just the brother, but once say the brother's house, chach on drahar. As we see there, it just loses the eye. So this is what we're looking for. That's the genitive there. Excellent, yeah. So I wouldn't try and get too bogged down with it, Jim. Um but it's definitely something to be aware of, especially for possession. That's probably one of the most common uses of the genitive. So hopefully that helps you a little bit. Yeah. And is there anything else there? That's a great way of putting this. Um, and um, Daniel, I believe, um, is that one of our members there? Could be. I believe it um, is, yeah. I believe it is. I believe it is. Uh, so... Uh, Daniel asks, uh, it says, I would be very interested to know more about the political significance of the Irish language in the independence movement from the 19th century onwards. Um, so it's a really, really interesting topic. Of course, you could have, you could go on for hours, I'm sure, about it. But um, mm -hmm. it's, um, it is, it has been very important in um, in the preservation of Irish language in the current state of language uh, of the Irish language today, and even in how I, the Irish language has, has evolved in the past century uh, it, and it's extremely interesting so um, if anyone's interested just google um, the um, the Irish language revival and it's um, it'll it, it'll bring a, about a lot of information on that so it's extremely interesting uh, mm. stuff yeah that's how Conor Na Gaelga the... came about yeah yeah, exactly. Conor Na Gaeilge was literally just about to say that. Um, so that's it started then as a kind of a movement to preserve, I suppose, and promote Irish identity, culture, language, all of that around the time of the, you know, the War of Independence and all of that. So it was very politically charged at the time, I would say, and um, very much interlinked with kind of Irish identity and things like that. Um, but Conor Na Gaeilge or the Gaelic League is still there today and is one of the main organizations that fights for Irish language rights and and organizes Irish language events and things like that so as you said Siobhan a lot of that from that time is still very present today and influences Irish language um changes and and the the kind of the changes that happen in the government even with Irish language have a lot of influence from Conor Na and Forest Na Gaeilge and other um um organizations like that but it's a hugely vast topic I don't think we could really cover it in a, a QA. and um, so if if this is the Daniel we're thinking of from Pubble I'll I'll give you some books maybe that um you could read on, on Pubble I'll, I'll reach out to you and we can talk about some books that might help you because it's a it's a very interesting thing to to learn and, and read about so um I might have to just follow up after this instead of uh, on the Q&A because it's a bit too yeah, much. Yeah, we should today. add those to the blog post as well. Kinte, yeah, absolutely. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Um, anything else interesting there? So there's lots of um, grammatical questions coming in about gender of noun and the, how mm. to recognise gender of a noun, um, how to learn the genitive form. How to, um so um it's quite a, so the should we cover that one on the gender of a noun? Uh, quick. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. We can do um we can try and get some some basic information in to help you in the Q and A. Okay, yeah. so gender of a noun. So if it's not with the def definite article, yes, you're right. It's very hard to spot it because the definite article is a dead giveaway a lot of the time. It tells you if there's a shevu um, on a word that starts with a consonant, it's going to be feminine. If there's a T on a word that starts with a vowel, it's going to be masculine, things like that. So 
if there's not, um, some endings of the word can help you. Um, so for example, words that end in L-A-N-N, -N, like Laurelin, Bialin, they're all feminine. All of the professions, so like Muntor, Dachtor, um, Ineltor, all of those, they're all masculine. And um, most countries and languages are feminine. So there are three rules that you can say, okay, is it this, is it this? And that might help you. Otherwise, honestly, I think the best thing to do is have an online dictionary or an online source at hand to confirm. Um, especially if you're in your early days of learning. Um, it can be a bit overwhelming to have a big list of endings of words and say, okay, this is how I spot the gender. Um, and that's definitely something you can keep referring back to and maybe learn a few at a time and get used to those. Um, but those are my main three tips. So if it's a country or a language, it's usually feminine. If it ends in L-A-N-N, -N, it's usually feminine. And if it's a profession or um, a career, I suppose, like doctor, a doctor, a doctor, a teacher, they're masculine. Um, what else? Can you think of any more? I find um, if a word has uh, a slender ending, um, so if it's in like I R I L or something, most more often than not, it will be feminine. Now, drahar is a is an exception to that, as we saw there, but more often than that, than not, it is it it, it is feminine. Um, so um, that's that's one thing that you'll notice a lot of the time as well. Like for example, cheer, country, T I F R. Like mm -hmm. I know that's feminine because when a lot of the time, if you're used to Irish. You'll you'll already know these words within um phrases, and you can think cheer, right? Where do I hear that? Oh, team the cheer. So yeah, na cheer. All right, that's feminine because na. Yeah, so that's the 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 feminine definite article of when it's in 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 the genitive. So you know if you've if if you've got to gotten to that stage, your brain kind of automatically like goes through a bit of a uh, might not automatically do it, but it, it has like um built up a database of like phrases and stuff. So you can figure out oh yeah it's if if I said it like this earlier on, so therefore it's the, the it's it's in the it's feminine or masculine and so that's way to, uh, one way to do it but don't be ever don't ever be afraid of using the dictionary it doesn't matter how advanced you are in irish the dictionary mm -hmm. is your friend there's no need to be ashamed of using it it's not a childish thing it's not a silly thing just use the dictionary and there's great apps for phones these days now chongland that site uh, we we shared there brilliant um uh it, it has a great app and um folklore.ie as well and you can see it going at the bottom there and uh, so folklore.ie changlin.ie they're very accessible on the phones so it's very good and changlin you can use that offline as well um mm -hmm. on your phone if you've downloaded the app so it's um it's brilliant brilliant um to have these uh, but i would i would say there are lists as you were saying there ashling uh, i know there's quite an extensive list in the gilga gun straw um a book and um it's uh or grammar duck and straw i should say so it's often in grammar books you'd find this and it's um it's it they're they're good to see and uh, but to really for tuning into that i would say be quite you have to have, read some form of proficiency or else you're just going to bog yourself down with it all but it's very handy to see oh yeah the words that end in slender vowels are more often than not um slender consonants sorry are more often than not feminine and uh, that mm -hmm. sort of thing um but th th as, as you're saying ashton there words begin in l a big english is saying l a n n it's very handy to know that uh, those little tricks uh mm -hmm. very handy altogether and strangely enough compared to other um european languages words that end in vowels in irish are more usually masculine whereas i think in European languages usually think of words that um, end in vowels to be feminine or fe feminine names and stuff like that. But um, kind of like Alex, Alexa, that sort of thing, you know, add on a vowel at the end and oh, it's feminine. It's feminine now. So it's quite the opposite in Irish. Um, so, yeah, uh, so there's there's a lot to it that we couldn't all cover now. But I think we've, mm -hmm. we've uh, I hope at, at least we've, we've given a good um, run through um, um, can what? 
Agusa in Rodella. Um, so, uh, um, Shikamahe called Gwil YouTube Big Mull RV Sean Arenas. Good to see it. <laughs> the Allegratum is working <laughs> and um, uh, and suggesting our videos. Uh, so let's see anything else there. Well, it's it's now the hour, so perhaps we'll we'll wrap it up unless you see something interesting there now, um, Ashling. Yeah, I think that's probably all we have time for tonight. Um, there's a few more questions about grammar coming in too, but we'll have we have one of these every month, so you know definitely do. Um, if you submit your questions in early to the form, we can address them in time. So sorry if we didn't get to answer your question this time around. Um, but as I say, we do have these every month, so you can definitely submit your question next time. Um, so yeah, it was lovely to to spend the last hour with you, and hopefully we got to answer your questions. Um, and stay safe and healthy and everything with everything that's going on. Um, yeah, and before we wrap up, um, uh, you might be interested in trying out our taster, which is free, and also, um. We've got some other free resources. So the taster is a part of the um, bite size course that you can you'll always have access to. Uh, so it doesn't just disappear after a few day a few days like a trial does. So that you'll always have that. And also we have more resources. Uh, we have a free book on how to use your Irish every day. And um, we've got an email course for Irish be um, beginners, and we've got a singing course as well, um, where you can learn three. Uh, common Irish songs and they're all available at that link there um, so I, I hope you all find um, those resources useful all right so I guess we we'll wrap up then we should get more of you grow we should go all in the way country for fad and so it was um it was lovely to be talking to y'all I guess I like I'm a very country of glory and I hope to be uh, talking to y'all soon again Thank you. Thank you. Plan, Tamil. Plan. Plan.